we have we're entering our second to last topic for this class. We're headed for the home stretch. Um, we have intermolecular forces and phase diagrams and phase transitions, which is all kind of one topic. And then we're going to talk about nuclear reactions, and then we're done. So good work this semester. You're almost there. Um, I know this week is kind of a weird week with the testing and everything. So we're going to start talking about intermolecular forces today. Um, and then we'll see, we'll see how far we get and we'll see whether I'm just going to give you another paper assignment for Thursday and Friday, since you don't really have a full class period either day, we might just do another, another practice with this one with pH and equilibrium, since I feel like everybody can probably use a little bit more practice with with equilibrium still. And it'd be good to go back and remind ourselves how pH works since it's been like a whole week since we thought about it. Um, but we'll see We'll see how today's lecture goes, um, whether we do that or something new. Um, good random quiz questions. I don't think we'll get to all of these today, but there are some that are pretty relevant. Um, and this, let this be a lesson to you. You get more random science application questions answered if you ask more good questions on your quiz. Uh, and same with the relevant. The more relevant questions you ask, the more time we'll spend doing random quiz questions. So if you enjoy this part of the class, keep asking good questions. Um, I won't say the inverse of that because I want you to keep giving me good questions because it's more interesting for me. Um, all right, uh, let's just tackle a few of these. What's favorite chemical or science paradox? Well, that's the thing about science is it doesn't really have paradoxes so much as you have, sometimes if you have conflicting evidence, you have to find something that explains both sets of evidence. And so one of the things that's kind of interesting about that is it means that at different scales, different things take precedence. We're talking at the astronomical scale, things like charge, the, the, um, electromagnetic forces don't matter nearly as much as, say, gravity. But if you get closer, then gravity doesn't matter. And electromagnetic force is most important. And if you get closer still, then you get, you know, just the strong and weak nuclear force wind up taking over and being more important than everything else. Um, so that's kind of an interesting one. Probably the that's what's most interesting, though, is um, physicists, and by which I mean humanity in general, we can only account for about 5% of the mass of the universe. Um, we only know about 5% of what the universe is and you know, how it behaves and just in terms of sheer mass. You look at the amount of dark matter, um, which just means stuff we don't know what it is, we, but we know that it has mass. That accounts for about 95% of the entire universe. Um, and that's kind of a, that's not really a, paradox so much as it's just a mystery but that's still kind of cool um there's a lot left to be known um how many types of different types of chemistry are there well how much time you got um basically anything that is a physical object you can study the chemistry of it there's the chemistry of um you know developing new magnets for guitar pickups there's the chemistry of geology, there's a chemistry of astrophysics. There's all sorts of really interesting chemistry fields that are sort of subfields of something else. But any any science that you can think of has a chemistry aspect of it. And if, at a big enough school, you could probably take a graduate level class or an upper division class just in one tiny little section. Um, I took a graduate level class on um, surface chemistry which is basically if things aren't happening in the gas phase and they're not happening in the liquid or the aqueous phase, sometimes they're happening on the surface of a solid. And things behave differently on a surface compared to the gas phase or in an aqueous phase. So I took a whole semester long course just on surface science. Um, you know, you can basically get as, as niche as you want in whatever you're interested in. Um, and find a chemistry subfield there. The guy who taught that class, uh, I think it was, was it Steve George who taught that one? Um, basically, he has made his entire career out of figuring out ways to deposit really, really thin layers of things onto surfaces and doing things like changing capacity and of uh, batteries 
or changing how fast batteries degrade by depositing like a few atoms thick of this of uh, aluminum oxide on the surface of a lithium ion battery cathode. Um, and that's his entire career, his entire, is that Steve George? It was Steve George. The, yeah, Steve George was the ALD guy. Um, sorry, it's been a few years now and I'm trying to remember my, my professor's names. Um, so it's, you know, you can kind of go as deep down the rabbit hole as you want with that. There's so much research out there and so many cool things to be found out there. Uh, something a little more relevant, why are we use three different temperature units? Do we talk about where Fahrenheit comes from? Like zero Celsius and 100 Celsius, we talked about that, right? Zero Celsius, freezing point of water, 100 Celsius, the boiling point of water makes a lot of sense. Um, do we talk about what zero Fahrenheit and, and 100 Fahrenheit are? So zero Fahrenheit was basically as, as cold as, I think his name was Lord Fahrenheit. Um, you know, some, some European white dude with too much time and money and not enough to do um, came up with the temperature Fahrenheit scale. And he just started mixing ice water and salt and he got down the coldest thing he could get. He called that zero. Um, and then the 100 Fahrenheit is uh, the body temperature of a cow um, because he was a landowner in the you know post-Renaissance enlightened period and cattle were very important. Um, or at least that's the story I was told. I have not verified that recently. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, 100 Fahrenheit is the body temperature of a cow. I don't know if that's coincidence or just the definition, but either way. Um, so we use Fahrenheit. We don't, shouldn't really use Fahrenheit anymore. Water makes a whole lot more sense to use than Fahrenheit, but, um, we're stubborn here in the U S and so we don't like to adapt to Celsius, even though everybody else, even the few countries that still use like feet and inches, um, still use, they use Celsius now in the UK, they use Celsius, but they still use inches and feet. Um, so even the UK can admit that Celsius is better than Fahrenheit, but for whatever reason, we're stuck with Fahrenheit for now. Um, and then why do we involve Kelvin? Why do we use Kelvin for anything? Why not just stick with Celsius? Because we want zero, Kelvin is absolute zero. It's the point where you cannot get any colder. So basically, when they first, if you plot temperature in Celsius versus the volume of a gas, you got something that looks like this. We just tracked that back to where it hits zero. And that's where we defined zero Kelvin or minus 273 Celsius. One last note about temperature. Kelvin doesn't get a degree symbol. Somebody in this class has asked me about that. Do you remember the answer, Logan? Because it's not on a scale. So degrees Fahrenheit and degrees Celsius is because you set zero and you set 100 and then you just break it up in between. Degree means that you, you have a set amount and then you break it up into smaller chunks along the way. So like 360 degrees is one rotation um, or 100 degrees Fahrenheit is a certain temp or zero to 100 Fahrenheit is a certain, you know, difference in temperature. And then you break it up into smaller chunks from there because Kelvin is just set at zero and doesn't have a maximum. Theoretically, it's not a degree scale. So we don't put a degree Kelvin. It's just Kelvin. Not that anybody would ever mark you wrong. I guess I shouldn't say everybody. I would never mark you wrong for writing degrees Kelvin, but I can't speak for other even more pedantic chemistry instructors you might have in the future. Um, but it's just something to pay attention to. Um, last but not least, potential consequences of gene editing. That's, that's, a whole, that's a whole rabbit hole. We'll save that in the last one. We'll do the black holes one for now. Um, because we talked about black holes and then got more questions about black holes. So why do, does time behave differently around a black hole? Basically because mass stretches space and time. When you think about the, the 
analogy that gets used is if you think about um, taking a sheet and putting it on a bed and then putting a bowling ball in the middle of the bed, what happens to the sheet? It all kind of like kind of comes down to the, towards the middle, right? If you pulled that sheet hard enough, you would actually cause it to rip, right? Turns out anything with mass does that to the actual shape of space and time. We just can't perceive it with our eyes or with much, much of what we measure with um, when it comes to our senses. So I mean, a black hole is basically stretching that space and time to the point where it rips. And if it rips, then all of a sudden everything behaves differently. You can't really have. So think about our sheet analogy. If you actually rip a hole in the sheet and then you want to know, well, how does the sheet, sheet be, how does the cloth behave at that rip? Well, there is no cloth at that rip. It's a rip. It's a hole. Right. So it basically space and time don't behave in any way we can really explain with physical analogies. Um, because all of our physical analogies are based around the fact that we perceive things in three dimensions and that time is a real thing to us. Um, if you want another, if you want a fun, trippy movie about time, uh, has anybody watched the movie Arrival with Jeremy Renner and Amy Adams? Really good sci-fi from same director as the Dune series um, from about like 2016, I want to say. Um, it's uh, it's really good and it gets into the nature of how different species might perceive time differently. Um, highly recommended if time is interesting to you and the idea of human perception of time is just one of many possible perceptions of time. Um, and if that sentence just sounded like gibberish to you, then don't watch that movie. But uh, unless you like gibberish, then go for it. Um, I really like that movie. I like everything that Dennis Villeneuve does. So highly recommend it. Relevant quiz questions. I always talk about how we're like earth chauvinistic. All of our constants and things like that are all based around, well, we're on earth. So water is the default. pH is based on, you know, a neutral solution is seven. Um, do gas laws apply the same way outside of earth? The answer is yes, in this case. Gas laws are universal. They're just based on the fact that it's a gas. So any gas anywhere is still going to behave the same way. The only constant is that R value, and that R value shows up everywhere. That R value is universal, um, with the possible exception of really weird, you know, situations like the surface of a black hole. Um, uh and along with that look at the last one um looking at all the ways r can be represented how can we be sure they're all equal to each other because they can only measure and no matter what units we're using or what application we're using to look at r r winds up being the same value um within within sig figs and as we add more sig figs we just get more and more agreements so even though it's all these weird applications it's still the same value, just like the speed of light shows up all, all over the place in physics and in places that it doesn't really have any business existing, like E equals MC squared. Why would speed of light be involved in that equation? That's just kind of how the universe works. Um, and same is true with R. Um, the other one I want to get to, there's a couple of quick ones on here, but Along the same lines, why is phase change so important? Well, when we're talking about gas laws, gas laws only apply to gases, right? So if something goes through a phase change, if you have a gas and it condenses to a liquid, you still have a gas. Kind of everything sort of changes if you're not talking about a gas. So um, that's why that those two assumptions about um, about the ideal gas law, the ideal gas assumptions was no intermolecular forces, intermolecular um, interactions, which the practical result of that is no phase change. Does anybody remember the other one? 
ideal gas laws. We're assuming that the, that you will have no phase change, and also the atoms don't take up any space, which is a reasonable assumption as long as you don't get into really, really condensed structures, which again, so again, no phase change. Gas molecules have zero volume. All right, and then the last thing to talk about just real quickly, um, is there really any difference between using, between saying 1.34 e to the plus three versus 1.34 times 10 to the three? Those mean the exact same thing, right? So but it's a lot easier to type this into a search bar than it is to type this. And same with your calculators. So this is just a shorthand that allows you to not have to type in times 10 to the third. You just write E3. It means the same thing. Some search engines and some um, online calculators get a little bit lazy. It should always be a capital E. But for a while, Google was using lowercase e in the same way, which isn't technically accurate because e is its own value, like pi. Does anybody remember what the value was? Who's had a math class recently that talked about e? 2.17 2 or 2.71 or something like that. Um, but they use lowercase e and uppercase e interchangeably in some online calculators. You just kind of have to read it for context. Like, are we talking about e the fundamental constant or are we talking about e like scientific notation? Just something to watch out for. Um, all the TI-83 calcul TI calculators and most of the actual physical calculators you can hold will be really careful about making it a capital E. Um, but some of the search engine calculators, not so much. Oh yeah, one more point. So somebody last, this was from last quarter. Um, somebody did the uh, Van der Waals gas equation and had tried to solve for pressure um, before plugging in the numbers. So remember that problem where we said, oh, what's the pressure of this? And you know, gave you all the value of what's A and B for water. Um, if you take a physics class, physics class, uh, physics in general is notorious for just saying, well, that makes it too complicated. So we're just gonna assume zero wind resistance or we're gonna assume this or that, kind of like these. Um, so you may have learned in a physics class that you're supposed to do all your algebra before you plug in your numbers. Sometimes that's a lot more trouble than it's worth. This was actually a really easy equation to solve. If you have all the variables except for P and you plug them in and just start doing arithmetic to simplify, this is actually really, really straightforward to solve for P. If you try to do all of the all of the algebra before you plug it in, you wind up with this. That's less fun to deal with. Um, so when in doubt, my recommendation is usually if you have a bunch of numbers and you have or a bunch of variables and you have the numbers for those variables, just plug it in and start simplifying. It's only going to make your life easier. Um, and that doesn't bother me at all. Your, when it comes to your physics instructors, you know, they can demand whatever they want for their class. That's not really realistic for this class. This is not an algebra class. And that just turned into like your algebra two final, um, just by, because you tried to do it before you substitute it in. All right, any questions about gases and things like that before we move on? Cool. Let's talk about what happens when this is not true. When, when we do have intermolecular forces, first we should define what those inter, what an intermolecular force is. Um, we've talked about compounds and how molecules are formed, the like covalent bonds and ionic bonds. Those are all what are considered intramolecular force. Intra means internal. So intramolecular forces mean are the forces that hold a molecule together, that keep it from becoming a bunch of individual atoms. Intermolecular forces 
are going to be the forces in between separate molecules. So if we have two water molecules, the covalent bonds and the difference in electronegativity and filling the valences, that's all the intramolecular forces. But the fact that there's a partial positive on the hydrogen and a partial negative on a, on a nearby oxygen, those are going to have some interaction with each other. That's an intermolecular force. So it's basically the attractive forces that cause separate molecules to actually come together and go through a phase change to become a, what we call a condensed phase matter. So a condensed phase just means anything that's a liquid or, or a solid. So we're going to start by just talking about those phases a little bit. I mean, this is kind of review or kind of just common sense. You're high schoolers. You have dealt with the fact that things can be solid or liquid or gas for a long time now, right? Um, but we, this being a new topic for us, we'll start by kind of defining them. Um, we didn't talk about this when we first started talking about matter, did we? I think I cut that part because knowing we were going to get to this eventually. Um, so the difference between gases and liquids and solids is basically how condensed they are. For gases, for the most part, those two assumptions that they don't interact and that they take up no space relative to the space of the container is a pretty good assumption. Um, and they basically are just ping pong balls bouncing around randomly. There's mostly empty space. Again, think about a giant moving box with 100 ping pong balls in it. Seems like a lot of ping pong balls, but that box is still mostly empty space, right? That's kind of the way that the makeup of gases, except even more extreme. Um, you know, picture this entire room with 100 ping pong balls bouncing around randomly. That's closer to how much empty space there is in a gas. Um, but if we do take those gas molecules that are just bouncing around randomly, if we do force them together, we can get these intermolecular forces to basically cause them to stick together. And if these, if they stick together, but they still have enough movement that they're kind of, um, moving around next to each other, they're still all rolling over each other but they're moving around still, that's what we call a liquid. So it's in a difference basically is that a gas is, has a, a variable amount of space and also a variable shape. It's basically just a whole bunch of empty space with some molecules in it. Um, and that can take up any space you want. Um, if you have a liquid, things are also kind of packed together, but there's still some movement happening. Um, I like to use concert analogies. A crystalline solid where everything is perfectly ordered, everything is, nothing's really moving around, is kind of like a concert where you have assigned seats. Once you sit down, everybody stays in their seats. There's not a lot of movement happening, right? Typically, those are also lower energy concerts. As you add more energy, this is be liquids more like the floor seats in a general admission show. You can move around, you don't have a assigned spot, so you can move around, move past each other, you can help move, make your way up to the front if you really try. Um, but in general, there's still not a lot of empty space. And gases are like a mosh pit. Mostly empty space, lots of high energy movement happening. Um, and it, the analogy works pretty well. Because if you, if you took a bunch of motorhead bands and you put them in assigned seating and then motorhead started playing, the energy would increase, right? And pretty soon it would look more like a general admission show. And then if motorhead kept playing, eventually it's going to start looking more like a mosh pit, right? You keep adding energy and you go from most ordered, to less ordered to least ordered. All right, so what causes, it's not really assigned seating in these crystalline solids or liquids, right? 
So what is it that actually causes them to kind of stick together and form these shapes? That's the intermolecular forces. Pressure can help because pressure forces everything to get close and allows them to bump into each other and stick. However, it turns out that those intermolecular forces, remember when we, before the midterm, one of the last things we covered was, is it a polar molecule or not, right? And then I promised you it was gonna be important eventually, but we, then we just left it for last four weeks or so um, and haven't talked about polarity at all. Polarity is the number one thing that causes these intermolecular forces. If you have a molecule that's got a partial negative charge on one side and a partial positive charge on the other, then when those molecules run into each other, there's going to be some attraction between them. It's not as strong of an attraction as a covalent bond or an ionic bond, but it is still an attractive force. And so this is what happens when you have a phase change, when you force these molecules closer together, or if you slow them down enough, then that means that you can basically allow them to stick. Let picture, picture covering our motorhead fans in Velcro. If they're high energy enough, they're still bouncing around freely, right? But as they slow down, when they bump into somebody, they're gonna stick. That's a little bit like a phase change. And that's why that assumption that there's no intermolecular forces means no phase change. If there's no attractive force, if there's nothing drawing these things together, then they will never go through a phase change. They will just act as a gas no matter how cold you get them. They'll just be slower moving gases. All right, so we're basically just gonna go through sort of a checklist of these are the possibilities. Um, we're gonna go from strongest attractive forces to weakest attractive forces. Remember we were talking about liquid helium and liquid hydrogen the other day and I talked about how like the boiling point of liquid hydrogen is like two Kelvin, really, really low, right? But it still will, will turn into a liquid if you get it cold enough. That means that there has to be some amount of intermolecular forces, even in, in a totally non-polar molecule. And so we're going to go, when we go through this checklist, when, one of the ways that I ask questions about this is basically, here's the situation. What type of intermolecular forces are present? And you're basically just going to go down the list. Does it have these characteristics? Does it have those characteristics? But the nice thing is that it's always going to have the last characteristic, um, which Remember Van der Waals gas law, Van der Waals equation, same guy. Van der Waals also has Van der Waals forces. Van der Waals forces are the weakest kind that are present in everything. But we'll start the, at the other end. Um, the, the strongest intermolecular force that you can have is a force called an ion dipole interaction. And so a polar molecule, a dipole is another word for a polar molecule. A dipole is anything that has, um, has a part of the molecule is um, missing some electrons and part of the molecule has some extra electrons. Right? And so anytime you've got a polar molecule, it is a dipole by definition. In, does anybody remember what our criteria were for a polar molecule? That was a long time ago. Polar bonds and asymmetry. Good. You studied better for the midterm than I thought. Uh, no, not a, not a dig at you. I would have forgotten that if I was a student. It had been a four weeks since I had to think about that. Um, so anything that has polar bonds, which is based on the electronegativity, right? And, not or, this is and asymmetry. Those are our two criteria for determining if it's a polar molecule. And as long as you have those two things, then the molecule as a whole is a dipole and has this partial positive and partial negative piece. So if you have a dipole that has these partial positive and partial negative and you expose it to, to an ion, that's going to have some attraction, right? It doesn't matter what type of ion, if you put an oxygen or if you put a water molecule next to 
a sodium ion, the oxygen's more electronegative than the hydrogen, right? So oxygen is going to have is the bigger bully, the one that's pulling the electrons towards itself. So a partial negative on the oxygen next to a full positive charge from the sodium ion, that's a pretty strong attractive force. Not as strong as, as a true ionic bond where you have a plus charge and a negative charge, but still a pretty strong attractive force. How could you get an, a strong attractive force between a water molecule and um, a chloride? Something with a negative charge. Would it look the same? Is that gonna be an attractive force? No, a negative and a negative, right? So that won't work. But if one side of the molecule is a partial negative, then by definition, the other side has to be a partial positive. If the overall molecule is neutral, then the hydrogens have a partial positive. So if you put another, if you put a negative ion up next to a water molecule, the water molecules arrange themselves so that the hydrogens are pointed towards the ion. But in both cases, you have a pretty strong attractive force because you've got an ion next to a partial charge. So I just gave an example, but what's the solution that would have ion dipole forces? Salt water. Anytime you take an ionic compound and you dissolve it into a liquid, most liquids are molecular compounds or covalent compounds, right? So anytime you make a solution like that, where you're taking an ionic compound and you're dissolving it, you're making a solution where you have ion dipole forces. And if you can have ion dipole forces, what's another type of force you could have? Another type of attraction. You could have ion ion, but we just call that an ionic bond, right? What's the other possible combination? Partial charges attracted to other partial charges, right? We call those dipole-dipole attractions. And so if we're keeping track of our intermolecular forces, the strongest are gonna be ion-dipole. Then we're gonna have sort of 2A and 2B because they're, and 2B is what we call dipole-dipole. And 2A is really a subset of dipole-dipole attractions. There's a specific subset of dipole-dipole attractions that are even stronger than the average dipole-dipole attraction. Um, and those specifically are the ones where the strongest dipole-dipole attractions that you can have are when you get hydrogens involved. Because how many proton or how many electrons does a hydrogen atom have? Just one. And how many electrons does it have when it's got a full um, full valence? Two. Two. So where are the electrons for this hydrogen? It's got a full valence, but where are they? They're basically, they're in between the hydrogen and the oxygen. Basically, we have an exposed nucleus space pretty much here. There are no core electrons sort of surrounding that nucleus. So as a result, if you have a hydrogen attached to a really electronegative atom in a covalent bond, it actually makes a subset of dipole-dipole interactions called hydrogen bonds. And we're kind of picky with how we define that. And we're not talking about the hydrogen covalent bonds. We're talking about the intermolecular forces that you get when you have hydrogen in a covalent bond with basically one of our four most electronegative elements. Does anybody remember what those four most electronegative elements are? Fluorine, oxygen, chlorine, and nitrogen. 
Nitrogen is actually just as electronegative as chlorine, but sulfur is significantly less electronegative. So basically, if you have a compound where you have a hydrogen in a covalent bond with any of these four, when you take that and you put it into a liquid or into a solution, you're creating something that has hydrogen bonds. So water is a classic example. Um, water has oxygens attached or one oxygen attached to hydrogens, right? So that means that those intermolecular forces between the hydrogen and the next oxygen are stronger than normal because that hydrogen has no extra protection for its nucleus. It's a nucleus is basically just exposed because all of its electrons are being pulled towards the oxygen. <clears throat> Everything else, even though oxygen is more electronegative than pretty much everything else, it'll make polar bonds with pretty much everything else, but not nearly as strongly polar as oxygen to hydrogen or nitrogen to hydrogen. If you have a polar molecule, but it's not hydrogen attached to one of these four, it's still dipole-dipole interactions. It's just not as strong. Right, so because in its, we don't have another name to indicate the difference between these. We just say hydrogen bonds are one case of dipole-dipole attractions, and then there's everything else. Every other thing you have. So for instance, if we had methanol, Lewis dot structure for methanol looks like this. Actually, let's do ethanol, and I'll tell you why in a second. Is this a polar molecule? Polar bonds, yeah. Oxygen attached to anything else is going to be polar. And is it? does it have asymmetry? Yeah. The carbons and the hydrogens less so. This is actually a type of molecule that has sort of like a non-polar section and a polar section. But the fact that it has a polar section means the whole thing, consider the entire molecule to be a polar molecule. This bond is polar, but won't result in hydrogen bonds. It'll result, this bond will allow it to have dipole-dipole interactions, but not hydrogen bonds. This bond allows it to have hydrogen bonds. So the boiling point for this compound is about 78 Celsius. Compare that to the same, the same atoms arranged differently. If we put the oxygen in the middle of the two carbons, Same formula, same atoms, for the most part, it's the same molecule. This one can't form hydrogen bonds, though. Because right? even though the oxygen is still there and there's still hydrogen, there's no the hydrogen isn't attached to the oxygen. And oxygen to carbon is not as polar of a bond. So this is dimethyl ether. This has a boiling point about negative 20 Celsius. Simply because this, these molecules can't be held together as strongly because it doesn't make hydrogen bonds. Right? There's still, this is still a molecule that's a polar molecule. It still has attractive forces between the oxygen on one side and the partial positives on the next, the other side but not nearly as strong as having an OH group, All right? So this molecule makes hydrogen bonds, this molecule doesn't. All right, so here's some slides. This is just a drawing of all the possible interactions between dipole-dipole situation. Um, every Positive, partial, positive, partial, negative is technically interacting with every other partial, positive, and partial, negative. 
But as they fall, as they get further apart, those forces fall apart really quickly. Um, somebody who took physics, did you talk about electromagnetic forces in physics yet? Or is it, was it mostly just Newton's laws? Okay. Um, so turns out that the force of gravity in physics has this, the form for that equation is uh, mass one times mass two times a constant G over the distance between the two squared, if I'm remembering it right. The force of attraction or repulsion between things that have charges is looks really similar, except instead of the masses, it's the charges. And instead, but it still has this over R squared term, which means that if you double the distance, the force go, drops by a factor of four. So basically only the closest interactions matter. So if you look at all the blue lines in this figure, all the blue lines are repulsive forces pushing things away, but all the red lines are attractive forces pulling everything closer. And as long as you get those negatives closer to the positive than they are to another negative, there's a net attractive force there, right? Because it's all just about, can you arrange it so that everything that's got an attractive force is closer than everything within a repulsive force? All right. Uh, and that's what that means. Electrostatic forces decay as one over R squared. That's what that's saying. Logan? For the, um, like, wanting you to get the positive and negative force, like, why doesn't everything sort of form just a circle? Right? It does, basically. But the thing is, these molecules, if it's a liquid, these molecules still have enough individual motion that they're kind of constantly shuffling around each other. Right, so they're gonna, on average, they're gonna arrange themselves like this, but that's still just the average. They're still going to move, be moving around. If you put it into a crystalline solid where there's no molecular motion, they stay in that shape. And you get these really, this really clear, they call it a lattice structure, where you get oxygens with two hydrogens on either side covalently bound, and then two hydrogens um, that are basically surrounding the, the lone pairs. Um, because remember the shape of these water molecules is tetrahedral, right? And so you wind up with this kind of repeating structure that looks, yeah, basically like, just like you said, um, where that's everything is satisfied. All right, so here's some examples of um, change, looking at different dipole, different levels of dipole dipole attractions and their boiling points. These molecules are all about the same size, um, which we haven't really talked about the effect of molecular weight on boiling point yet. We'll get to that shortly. But if you look at the difference in boiling point between propane and dimethyl ether, dimethyl ether was the one I was just talking about. Boiling point about um, minus 20 Celsius, minus 25 Celsius. Um, goes propane, dimethyl ether, then methyl chloride, because chlorine to a carbon is a more electronegative, or is a, it makes a more um, polar molecule. And then this dipole moment piece is basically a way you can, you can sum up all the polar bonds in the asymmetry. So a more polar molecule has a higher dipole moment. Dipole moment, you can think of it as basically what's the difference between the partial charges. Um, if you have a partial positive and a partial negative, the bigger the dipole moment, the bigger the difference. In, the, in other words, the bigger the charges are on the two ends of the molecule. We see a pretty 100 Celsius difference between all of these really small molecules 
they're all close to the same size, but with just with a different dipole moment. Um, propane boils at negative at 231 Kelvin, so about minus 40. And then acetonitrile boils at 355 Kelvin, so closer to um, closer to what was that about 50 Celsius, 70 Celsius. And that's due entirely to just how polar all are those molecules. All right, so this is the slide on hydrogen bonds. We've already talked about those. So here's a good practice problem. Of these molecules, which of them can form hydrogen bonds? So CH3, CH3 is ethane, natural gas. Can, can that form a hydrogen bond? Without even drawing this Lewis dot structure for ethane, we can answer that question, right? Because what does it need to make hydrogen bonds? Hydrogen and one of those four most electronegative elements, right? This doesn't have nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine. So without even drawing the structure, we know it can't form hydrogen bonds. Well, I already used ethanol as an example, CH3, CH2OH. Fact that you've got an OH in there, an oxygen directly attached to a hydrogen means that you can make hydrogen bonds between those molecules. How about methylamine, CH3, NH2? Any of you who've watched Breaking Bad recently may remember methylamine had like at least a season and a half dedicated just to methylamine. Um, so methylamine, can methylamine make hydrogen bonds? Yeah, nitrogen's one of our list of four. And it's got the hydrogens directly attached to the nitrogen. So in Breaking Bad, they find methylamine as a liquid because it's um, a liquid at room temperature in, in the real world. I'm not a huge fan of Breaking Bad just because it makes all chemistry teachers seem like they they could make meth. Most chemistry teachers could make meth, not like that guy. Um, but I really love it as a piece of art. It's really, really good, well done TV show. Um, and it gets the science right pretty much all the time. It just it leaves out little pieces so that you can't actually use it as a recipe. Um, but all the science that it does show is pretty accurate, um, including methylamine being regulated by the DEA and that being a choke point for their their production line that's a that's a real thing DEA doesn't just doesn't regulate all of the components needed for making illicit substances it just picks a couple that don't get used for anything else on a regular basis like methylamine like iodine um, if you try to buy iodine in its solid form, not as a solution that you get at the grocery store, you have to go through this giant DEA approval process to buy solid iodine. Uh, it's really a big headache. It takes us about six months every time we have to order iodine because they double check how much you ordered last time. Are you using it at a, up at a faster rate than a, than a school of your size should be using it? Um, fill out all the paperwork. They do background checks on everybody who's working there. And then when all of that's done, they'll let you buy iodine. They don't do that for everything else because you really only need one to keep track of one of the components to a recipe, right? Can't get the iodine, you can't use that pathway. Um, but that's neither here nor there. We already used water as an example. So it's relatively straightforward to see whether or not we're gonna be able to make hydrogen bonds, right? Um, 
It's just a matter of remembering those four elements. And then also you kind of need to know the Lewis dot structure. It's not just enough to say that there's oxygen and hydrogen in the same molecule. It has to be a hydrogen directly attached to an oxygen in order to make a hydrogen bond. The other one that shows up all the time is hydrochloric acid, or when it's a gas, it's hydrogen chloride. The hydrochloric acid is gonna have really strong attractive forces because chlorine is one of our, one of our four, right? Hydrochloric acid as well. All right, these last ones have a couple names. Um, these are the ones that are present in everything. And they're called either London dispersion forces, London as a name, not the town. or van der Waals forces, which just get abbreviated B, B, D, W forces. Uh, and these are the ones that are present in everything. You don't have to think about these. Anything that has a nucleus and an electron has London dispersion forces. And since that's everything, we don't have to worry about it. If it exists and it has mass, if we're studying it in chemistry, it has London dispersion forces or van der Waals forces. And those basically just come for, from the idea that we, if we wind up with, we just have like say a helium atom that has two electrons around a nucleus. If those electrons are moving around randomly, there's a finite probability that it's at any given time, both electrons are on one side of the molecule. Makes sense, right? Even if you're trying to avoid your sibling while you're both home alone, there's a chance you'd both wind up in the same room at the same time, right? Not that anybody would necessarily want to be avoiding their sibling. All siblings love each other, right? But... <laughs> Um, I remember what I was like to my little brother, and I know he avoided me, and that's reasonable. Um, but if you do wind up with both electrons on the same side of the atom at the same time, you get a temporary dipole because you get extra electrons on the left side of the molecule and not enough electrons on the right side. <laughs> Even if it's a totally nonpolar molecule, the way that the electrons move creates these temporary dipoles. And we put these temporary dipoles next to another dipole, uh, next to another helium atom. They kind of cause, the, so here's our temporary dipole. If you put it next to another helium atom, it's going to push away both of the other electrons, right? Which means it causes the molecule next to it to also turn into a temporary dipole. In all of this, so you wind up with something that looks kind of like our dipole dipole interactions even though they're not very strong interactions and they're temporary, you get this sort of, they also call them induced dipoles, where it's a nonpolar molecule, but it has some characteristics where sometimes it acts like a polar molecule. Um, and so the way that we can sort of distinguish what atoms are going to do this more often than others? It's basically, if it has more electrons, there's a larger possibility that it's going to do this at any given time. So if all we're, we really look at for these is how many electrons it has, most of our molecules we're dealing with have are neutral or close to it, right? So if you're increasing the number of electrons in a neutral molecule, what else is increasing? If you I'll say it again. If you increase the number of electrons, but the molecule is neutral, what else is increasing? Protons. And if protons are increasing, the mass is increasing, right? 
So a lot of times we, we can just estimate how strong these intermolecular forces, these London dispersion forces are by looking at how big the molecule is. Larger molecular weight generally means um, more attractive forces, more electron dispersion forces. Which is why you can get totally nonpolar molecules like fluorine is completely nonpolar. Yeah, fluorine is really electronegative, but it's really just a bonding with another fluorine, right? So it doesn't have the polar bonds aspect. But fluorine, fluorine, bromine, and iodine, if you look at their boiling points, they're all nonpolar, but as the molecular weight goes up, so does their boiling point. And that's why you can have completely nonpolar molecules like, say, butter. Butter is made up almost entirely of nonpolar molecules, but it's a solid at room temperature. Meanwhile, a molecule like dimethyl ether is a polar molecule, but it's a gas at room temperature. And the difference between that, even though this has dipole-dipole interactions and butter doesn't in most greases, pretty much any grease or oil, is not going to have is going to be pretty much nonpolar, but the fact that they're just much larger molecules, um, a uh, a fatty acid that you would see in butter might be might be like seventeen carbons long. You have this giant molecule, even though most of this molecule is totally nonpolar. The fact that it's just so big means it'll be a solid or a liquid at room temperature, right? So how do I ask questions about that, about this? Is, well, basically I can ask you to rank these forces from strongest to weakest, um, but I can also say, okay, here's a couple molecules. What's gonna have the highest boiling point? What's the lowest boiling point? And you have to look at what type of forces are present and how big the molecule is in order to answer that. All right, so this is a good summary slide, although for whatever reason, this table that I found, I really like formatting this table, but I don't like that it goes weakest to strongest, which is backwards from how I wrote it on the board. But other than that, our strongest four intermolecular forces are ion dipole. Next strongest are hydrogen bonds. Then the rest of the dipole-dipole interactions. Then dispersion forces, which is literally all molecules and atoms. So if I ask you, here's a situation, what intermolecular forces are present, you should always just start by writing dispersion forces, because that's always true. The rest of them have to meet certain criteria, right? But everything has London dispersion forces. Here's another way I can ask a question about this. Okay, here's a drawing, like I've been drawing on the board. What type of forces am I showing? So for A, what type of force is that out of these four options? Is it ion dipole? No ion, so it's not ion dipole. That's easy to eliminate, right? Is it, and usually I go top down. That's easiest to eliminate. Next easiest to eliminate is going to be, is it, does it have hydrogen bonds? In this case it does, right? Fluorine's really electronegative. Hydrogen covalently bound to fluorine means you have that really, really polar molecule. So A is hydrogen bonds. What is B? Fluorine attracted to another fluorine. Is it ion dipole? Nope. Is it hydrogen bonds? That's easy to eliminate too. No hydrogen, right? Is it dipole dipole? The dipole dipole still needs to be a polar molecule attracted to another polar molecule. So it's not that because fluorine attached to another fluorine is nonpolar, right? So if it's nonpolar, the only thing it can be is London dispersion forces. How about C? That one's easy, right? Sodium ion 
attracted to a water molecule? What's the first thing I said? Ion. And last but not least, sulfur dioxide attracted to another sulfur dioxide. It's not ion dipole, no hydrogen, so it's not a hydrogen bond. Is it a polar molecule? Yeah, oxygen's more electronegative than sulfur, so you have polar bonds and you have asymmetry. So this is a dipole-dipole attraction. So even though it's there's four choices here, does everybody understand why I labeled these two as 2A and 2B? They're really the same thing, just a specific case, a subset of them. Um, but for whatever reason, because they're so extreme, these hydrogen bonds, they get classified as their own category um, because their behavior is kind of unique that way. All right, so let's think about phase change when it, when we're at looking at the, the last topic that we go over today. Um, if you go from a solid to a liquid, is that going to increase the number of intermolecular forces or decrease the number of intermolecular forces? If you have a whole bunch of water molecules, all aligned in this perfect lattice structure, solid structure. If we turn this solid into a liquid, what do we have to do to allow one of these water molecules to move around? Is that gonna increase the number of intermolecular forces or decrease? Decrease. This is why you have to put energy into a substance to get it to melt. You have to add energy in so that this molecule here can break these two attractive forces and move around. At low energy, everything's just going to stay stuck in that perfect structure where everything's satisfied. But as you give the molecules more energy, they can start to move around a little bit more. Is it going to break all of the Hydrogen bonds? No, because if this molecule breaks these two and then moves up here and makes new ones, it's still going to have some hydrogen bonds, right? We're just making it so that they can break and reform kind of randomly. So, but what would it take to actually go to a gas phase? What would happen? What do we have to do? We have to break all of the intermolecular forces to make it just one water molecule off by itself. That takes a lot more energy. Evaporating water is a lot more energy intensive than melting water, the melting ice. Because melting ice, you have to break maybe a third of the hydrogen bonds, probably even less than that. To make it a gas, you have to break all of them. Would you say that these forces increase the total stability of the substance, the more forces you have, the more stable it is? Yes. Think they're attractive forces, which means that, that, that if you, in order to break them out of this structure, you have to add energy in, which means you're taking it to a less stable state. If you take away, if we just have Earth floating around and we cease all sunlight to earth what happens to the earth it gets cold and what happens to all the water it all freezes right um, which is what you see on the surface of is it is it europa one of the moons of jupiter or saturn that's primarily water and it's frozen around the outside but the tidal forces from jupiter keep it liquid on the middle a similar way that we have we have a, a molten iron core uh, it has a molten water core and that's, um, but the surface where there's hardly any sunlight to warm things up is all solid. And so things are most stable when they're in their lowest energy state, which is usually solids.
Well, it gets stable is tricky because we have to start talking about the entropy of the universe in terms of what makes an, a reaction spontaneous is not just about being in the lowest energy state. It's also about increasing the entropy of the universe. And there are some case in entropy is basically disorder, randomness. And a gas is way more random than a solid. So gases have higher entropy, but they're also less stable in terms of energy. So there's really sort of a balancing act happening, which is why things can go back and forth between a liquid and a solid. Um, even though the solid in theory is the most stable, it's least got the least entropy. But that's not something we're not going to get into that level of thermodynamics in this class. So take Gen Chem. We'll talk about that in more detail. All right, uh, and so this is this is basically, I think I've drawn a graph similar to this for you. This is that Boltzmann distribution. Boltzmann was the guy who came up with the idea of entropy and randomness. And the Boltzmann distribution looks a lot like a bell curve. And what it really is, is in the, the y-axis is how many molecules have a certain energy, and the x-axis is that energy. So the and basically if think about our, our analogy of the ping pong balls and the moving box again right not everything is moving at the same speed there's an average speed for the ping pong balls in the moving box but not every ping pong ball is moving at the average speed some of them are moving faster than others right which is why if we're shaking our ping pong balls in the moving box there's a decent probability that one of them is going to pop out the top right that being able to break out of the top of that moving box is a lot like something going from a liquid to a gas. When you're shaking those ping pong balls around, if, they're at, if that's a, a liquid, and a, a molecule having enough energy to escape out the top is a lot like turning into a gas, and only a, a finite number of those molecules are going to have enough energy to do that. If I'm just really slowly shaking that box back and forth, are any of the ping pong balls ever gonna have enough energy to make it to the top? But as I start ramping up how fast I, sh I shake it, their average speed goes up and the probability that one of them has enough energy to escape goes up. Having the, the probability, the number of molecules that have enough energy to escape is basically what is the area under this curve above a certain energy cutoff, certain threshold. So if we put this, this dotted line and say, okay, this is the amount of energy that it takes to escape the height of the box. The number of molecules, like basically turn this shaded area into a percentage. For the red one, maybe it's 10% of the molecules have enough energy. If I slow down how I'm shaking it, this curve basically creeps that way. It still has the same general shape, but it gets, it moves further to the left. Logan? So this is also kind of explains why um, changes in phases don't have to Exactly. Any, no process in chemistry or in the real world happens all at once because there's never any possible temperature you could get to where 100% of the molecules are above that line. There's always going to be, no matter how much we flatten this out, as you increase the temperature, this whole thing just continues to flatten out. So you could imagine one shape of a molecule here that looked like not to scale, but you can imagine how you could make it hot enough that 80% of the molecules are to the right of that line, right? That would mean it's evaporating really, really quickly. It's still not instant because there's still these few molecules over here. Twenty percent of the molecules still don't have enough energy to make it, right? And so that takes additional time to get there. All right. This also means that even if we're below the boiling point of water some amount of evaporation is happening, right? 
even if it's really cold water, some tiny fraction, look at this, this blue curve, still has, I don't know, maybe 5% of the molecules have enough energy to make it above that threshold. Because even cold water will evaporate, which makes sense, right? That, that's in line with what we see in everyday life. Um, just because you don't get something up to boiling doesn't mean it doesn't evaporate, right? So phase change really is more complicated than we than we might initially think because it doesn't all happen at 100 Celsius. It happens at a, at a lower temperature, but just slower. And it also means that this, this finite fraction of the molecules that have enough energy means that we can actually get to an equilibrium. If we have a closed container, because if we have a closed container, then as some of these molecules evaporate off the surface, if it's closed, they stay in the gas phase there. If they stay in the gas phase there, there's a decent chance that they hit the surface again. And if they hit the surface again and aren't moving as fast as they were, they kind of get stuck again. So picture in our moving box analogy, when the bing pong ball flies out the top, let's say that it's still in the same room and there's a chance that it bounces back in. If it bounces back in, it could wind up getting stuck in the box again, right? Another one might bounce out to take its place, but we wind up with a case where there's no net evaporation happening. It's evaporating at the same pace that it's condensing. And now we have the tools, now that you understand equilibrium, we can explain why when you put the lid on your water bottle, it doesn't evaporate. But if you leave the lid off of your water bottle, it does. You leave the lid off of your water bottle, it never gets to equilibrium. Because as it evaporates, it's escaping the bottle and it's, you're never actually getting to that equilibrium point. Um, which also explains why in a humid environment, sweating doesn't cool you down nearly as much, right? Because it slows down the process of evaporation. All right. Um, we didn't quite get to the point where I want to give you a homework assignment on phase change yet. So I'll have, a, we'll have a, another equilibrium assignment tomorrow, or should we just do the one that you already did? How many? We, we feeling okay? Throw the phase. Oh. Patience. We will make it do at least a week from now probably at the end of next weekend, but I'll make it available for those of you who want to take a look at it. Okay, Lily? I'd have to check. Um, I think I said the end of the week, which is Friday. Also, if you haven't gotten your midterm back yet, I realized I haven't handed those back. Come grab it real quick. If you want it. Donna, do you want your midterm? You take it, then I don't have to carry it. Wait, or I think I take it. Right. Most of you got your, your grades back, at least. There you go. I don't have yours, I don't think, Taj. So I think okay, I think I did. Okay. No problem. See ya. Have a good one, Albert. Get back to one headphone. Thank you for answering all my questions. Oh, Andrew, right you're asking good questions. You're leading me exactly where I wanted to go. Thanks, so. Yeah, I'll